Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. Uh, is I will kill again. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old, over half my life. Uh, anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. I've done it before, and at the time I liked it. Dodd also says that if he ever escapes from prison, there is someone in particular that he will be out to kill. I'm not going to say who, but there is somebody out there. There's a man out there. There's a man? Yeah. Someone related to the case that got you imprisoned in the first place? Mm, not directly, no. But it's something that you know that you're going to do, or you, you plan to do, you want to do. Yeah. Did your execution do any good? I think it would. I think a few child molesters, anyway, are going to think twice before they do anything again. How do you live with yourself daily? At times, it's not easy. Uh, like I said, there's times I think about what I've done. Um, I think about some of the things the boys said before they died, and, and that's real hard to think about. Um, at other times, I just try to put everything out of my mind. Do you look forward to dying? In a way, yeah, I think it'd be a relief. I don't have to think about all these things anymore. Uh, and I know that's the only way I can guarantee I'm not going to hurt anybody else. Um, you know, right now I'd sit here and say I don't want to, but I know it'll happen. And the, and the honesty of it, if they want to be convinced or brainwashed into what they believe, then fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. He describes himself as a father. Loving and caring. I've always uh, looked after my children, even now. What kind of values you remember imparting to them? The kind were of values? You strict, were you strict with them, too? No, the not, as, no not as strict as, no. A lot of things that my dad did, I, I refused to do. Because I, I don't, see, I don't believe in hitting, hitting children. I don't believe in, in uh, spoiling a child, either. My, my values are such are that if crazy. you give enough you, love you, to you the children... You're of murdering 33 kids, <laughs> and you say you didn't believe in hitting I mean well anybody that knows you see first of all you're basing you're basing this garbage on what you've heard of me what happened to uh, what, what happened in the book of it case where was he picked up and uh, how did he get to the house and what happened with him I don't want to go in I don't want to go into the other uh, the five that I know about just take it that I did uh, Buckerbridge is not one that I killed so I don't know nothing about him the, the little bit that I know about him is that he was an employee of my. See, when you when you look about this this recall business, and and I'm not a prosecutor, John, but you just I know you're not. A, wait a minute, is not one that you killed, which suggests that maybe oh. in fact there were others that you did kill. No, no. Okay, I'm so, I'm sorry if I led you to believe. No, strike it then. That is wrong. To me, clowning it was a way of relaxation for me. You regressed into childhood. You were able to relax. And you could be uh, goofy if you wanted to, and still you had the facade of your face being covered. The clown suit hid his face and his evil crimes as well. Even today on death row, he's painting portraits of himself as a clown. The 33 Flavors Clown and the convicted killer of 33 can't help but chuckle at the irony. I used to do clowning, uh, and I don't know if you want to mention the name, for an ice cream company in Chicago who had 33 flavors. I used to, t I'm serious. Bressler Ice Cream Company. I was their contractor and I was also their clown. And Pogo the Clown was the clowning that I did for charity hospital work for the Democratic Party and, that, and Pogo the Clown is originally. Pogo comes from being Polish and on the go all the time, so it's Pogo. <laughs> on the go for Democrats as Norwood Park Committeeman. A visit with Rosalind Carter, the First Lady during the Carter administration. Gacy right here is hiding the fact that there are bodies buried under his house. He's the great deceiver. I always felt that service community and community service to others, you know, in my religious background, I felt if you serve other people, it, it'll come back to serve you. You know, I've always believed that way with generosity. 
So if he looks for good and he's generous, why'd he kill 33 people? Nobody knows, but the psychiatrists talk about how obsessive and meticulous he is, enough to kill repeatedly and to stack his victims in a careful and ordered manner, like cordwood under his house. Even now, he's obsessed and meticulous with his life. What's your life like? Day to day. Mm -hmm. I live it day to day. What do you mean? If you want to know what my life is like, I log it every day. For the last 12 years, all you got to do is ask. I can tell you everything. I can tell you it's the first meal they serve me here because I do it daily. What do you do? All every phone call, everything that I do, every time an officer is around me is logged. Every movement that I make is in the book here. And he and his lawyers have a log on his victims, too. Everything they did before they were killed. You know, when I tell you, I, I've got background information on it. We took each, each one of them by, uh, we took each one of the victims. And this is, this is by, by their names or by their indictment numbers. And what we did with each one of them, we did profile sheets on them. We wanted to know what, what this kid was into, what his background was. Chicago psychiatrist Daniel Johanna of Northwestern University spent a few hours this week screening the interview. He's very attentive to all details, and so he's sort of, uh, uh, that's the way that he operates. And that's how, that's how uh, people like him are able to cover up these, do these crimes and cover them up because they are well planned and organized. One thing John Wayne Gacy could not plan was the way he got that way. My dad was domineering in effect. He had a different set of values, but also a very stern individual. My dad drank a lot, and when he drank a lot, yeah, he was abusive to my mother and to me. But I never swung at my dad because I loved him for what he stood for. Maybe that's where it began to go wrong for John Gacy. He doesn't know, nor does he seem to care. He loses himself in his paintings. Why the skeleton? This was done by request. Somebody requested uh, a skull clown, and... Uh, Mostly the punk rockers and, and the undergrounders like that stuff there. This is Christ as I see him in myself. And it's monolithic because Christ, to me, is monolithic. He, he's all things to all people. This here is the, uh, the High Ho series, and, th and that is uh, self-explanatory. It's the Seven Dwarfs. And they've always stuck to me as a, as a great child painting. And so I've done a series of High Ho series paintings. And this is a 1990 one. This is called Hi-Ho Around the Campfire. It's, it's an original work. Walt Disney is a mentor for me because I, I've always enjoyed his great creativity. And the, uh, the seven dwarfs, if you actually look at all the faces, they represent uh, the, the seven different moods that most people can get into. Moods are important to John Gacy. He has so many of them himself, angry ones mostly toward his father and his victims, and especially, it seems, toward the victims' families who are constantly reminding him of his crimes. That one mother that gets on television all the time who thinks I should be uh, given 33 injections, I think she ought to take 33 Valiums and go lay down. know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this, <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now, and I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me, and without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. And it's, and it's real. It's true. Ted, what would your life have been like without that influence? You can only speculate. Yeah. Well, I, I know it would have been far better, not just for me, and, and it's, uh, excuse me for being so self-centered here, it would have been a lot better for me and lots of other people. I know that lots of other innocent people, victims and families. It would have been a lot better. There's no question but that it would have been a, a, a fuller life, uh, certainly uh, a life that would not have involved, I'm absolutely certain would not have involved 
this kind of violence that I have been, that I have committed. I'm uh, sure, Ted, if, if you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours, are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? Again, I, I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I've... Much too late, but ne better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases, murders that I was involved in. And it's hard to, it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and uh, diligently dealt with, and I think successfully, with the love of God. And yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that. And I can only hope that those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse will believe what I'm saying now that there is loose in their towns and their communities people like me today whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms particularly sexualized violence and what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is, in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today with stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago, this stuff, the slasher it's, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most, that is graphic violence on screen, particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there, switching the TV dial around, and come upon these movies late at night, or I don't know when they're on, but they're on, and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen. I mean, it's scary enough. I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today, or can pick up their phone and dial away for it, or send away for it, uh, can you help me understand this desensitization process that took place? Uh, what was going on in your mind? Well, by desensitization, I, uh, I describe it in specific terms, is that each time I'd harm someone, each time I'd kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, uh, especially at first, uh, enormous amount of of, of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards, but then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Now, believe me, I didn't. F it, it, the unique thing about how this worked, Doctor Dobson, is that I still felt in my regular life the full range of, of guilt and, and uh, remorse about other things, uh, regret, and uh, but you had this compartmentalized, this compartmentalized, very well focused. Uh, 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 very sharply focused area where I, it was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack. And everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? Was there, were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I, uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's, oh yeah. That's too painful. I would like to, uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that, that, uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. That, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? That's a very good question, and I'll answer it very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has, and I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. That's for sure. Um, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because because of we, as, as we've been talking there are there are forces that loose in, in in this country particularly again uh, this kind of violent uh, pornography uh, where on the one hand well-meaning decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundy's. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking. I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me. Going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore. Uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, and, and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Ted, as you would imagine, there's tremendous cynicism about you on the outside and I suppose for good reason. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe. Some people would believe. Yeah. And uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in Him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being in the, the the valley of the shadow of death is is something that I've become all that accustomed to, and that I you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's uh, it's gets kind of lonely, and yet I have to remind myself that every one of us. Uh, will go through this someday yes. in one way or another so and, man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have so this is just an experience which we all share and yeah which one of the interviews did you find the most disturbing and why
let me know in the comment section down below. If you think this video is interesting, leave a like and you can also subscribe to my channel for more similar content like this.